May it please the tribunal. It is my duty to present the uh, evidence upon counts one and two of the <coughs> indictment against the defendant Hess. Lord, uh, the uh, trial brief, which I believe the tribunal <coughs> have before them, uh, has been made out in the form of a fairly full note <coughs> of the evidence to which I intend to refer. And it may be uh, of convenience to the tribunal uh, to have it before them during the course of my presentation. My Lord, may I first prove the positions which he held and which are set out in Appendix A of the indictment and say a word about his early life. Uh, this defendant was born uh, in 1894. He is now 52 years old. He came to Germany for his education. He served in the German army during the last war. And in 1919, he uh, went to Munich University. There he became the leader of the Nazi organization in that university. And in 1920, he became a member of the Nazi party itself. He was uh, amongst the first of the SA and he uh, became the leader of the Students' Corps of Police. In 1923, he took part in the Munich Bush, and as a result of that, uh, he uh, was uh, sentenced to 18 months imprisonment, a half of which period he served in jail with Hitler himself. Uh, I stress that because it was during those seven and a half months in prison with Hitler that Hitler dictated Mein Kampf. I think I know what the difficulty is. Uh, this case was originally going to be pre rep uh, presented by the American delegation, and they did uh, have a brief of their own. It may be that that is the brief which uh, Mr. Justice Biddle has before him. Uh, it ought, in fact, to have been withdrawn. Have we got a spare copy? I'll send for a spare copy. Go on, come on. Uh, it was during that time uh, that uh, Hitler dictated Mein Kampf to this defendant. <coughs> Dealing with his actual appointments, from 1925 until 1932, he was private secretary and ADC to Hitler. Uh, in 1932, he became the chairman of the Central Political Committee of the party in, successor, uh, in succession to Gregor Strasser. Uh, in March 1933, after the Nazi party had come to power, he became a member of the Reichstag. And in April of that year, he was appointed deputy to the Führer uh, a position which he held uh, until he flew to England in May of 1941. <coughs> that uh, evidence so far is all contained uh, in two documents. One, a book called Dates of the History of the Nazi Party by Folks, uh, which is already in evidence its number is PS3132 and was put in evidence as US 592. The other document is uh, the Deutsche 
Pura Lexicon, PS3191, US593. <coughs> On the 1st of December 1933, he became Reich Minister without portfolio, uh, another position which he held uh, throughout the remainder of his time in Germany. And that appears in the Reich Gazette's blood. It is, it is PS 3178, and it goes in now as 248, GB 248. On the 4th of February 1938, he became a member of the Secret Cabinet Council. Lord, that is in the documenta. Perhaps. It is PS 1389 and becomes 249 GB. On the 30th of August, 1939, he became a member of the Council of Ministers for Defense of the Reich, PS 2018, becomes GB 250. On the 1st of September, 1939, he was appointed successor designate to the Führer after Goering. Goering, it will be remembered, was successor number one. And uh, during that time, he held the positions of Obergruppenführer in the SS and in the SA. Uh, that uh, completes the formal proof of the positions charged against him in the indictment. Uh, I would uh, say a word upon the authority that uh, he exercised uh, under and holding those positions. The tribunal will remember uh, that uh, in uh, appointing Hess as his deputy, uh, the uh, Führer decree, in the decree by which he made the appointment, I hereby appoint Hess as my deputy and give him full power to make decisions in my name in all questions of party leadership. The extent of his office as deputy Führer can be seen from the uh, party yearbook uh, of 1941 to which I would briefly refer the tribunal, and it appears on page 104 of the tribunal's document book. It is uh, PS 3163 and has already been put in as US 255. I quote from uh, that yearbook, by decree of the Führer of April the 21st, 1933, the deputy of the Führer received full power <coughs> to decide in the name of the Führer in all mat matters concerning party leadership. Thus, the deputy of the Führer is the representative of the Führer with full power over the entire leadership of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. The office of the deputy of the Führer is therefore an office of the Führer. In essence, it is the duty of the deputy of the Führer to direct the basic policies of party work, to give directives and to take care that all party work be done according to national socialist principle. All the threads of the party work are gathered together by the deputy of the Führer. He gives the final party word on all intra-party plans. 
and all questions vital for the existence of the German people. The deputy of the Führer gives the directives required for all the party work in order to maintain the unity, unity determination and striking power of the National Socialist German Workers' Party as the bearer of the National Socialist philosophy. In addition to the duties of party leadership, the deputy of the Führer has far-reaching powers in the field of the state. These are participation in national and state legislation, including the preparation of Führer orders. The deputy of the Führer in this way validates the conception of the party as the garda of national socialist philosophy. Two, approval of the deputy of the Führer of proposed appointments for officials and labor service leaders. Three, securing the influence of the party over the self-government of the municipal units. I would refer the tribunal to page 119 of the document book, which is a chart which sets out the organization of the deputy of the Führer's office. It appears, as I say, on page 119 of the document book. It is PS 3201, which becomes 251GB. Uh, I would particularly uh, refer the uh, tribunal to uh, the uh, square in the center showing the liaison, liaison officer of the Wehrmacht, showing his close association with the army, and on the right, in the right-hand column, at the top, chief of the foreign organization, about which I shall uh, tell the tribunal in a moment, commissioner for foreign pol policy, showing his concern with the foreign policy of the German state, <coughs> Commissioner for All techn Technological Matters and Organizations, Commissioner for All University ma Matters, a Commission on University Policy, showing his concern with the education of Germany, and two further down, Office for <coughs> Racial Policy, showing his concern with the anti-Jew policy the Nazi government followed. Uh, and at the bottom, Again, specialist on education. <coughs> but it will be seen, a glance at that chart will show that uh, he was really involved in every aspect and every branch uh, of Nazi life and the organization and administration of the state. As Reich Minister without portfolio, uh, he... Uh, was stated uh, in the law to secure the unity of party and state of the 1st of December 1933. Uh, it was stated there that his task was to guarantee the close working cooperation of the party and the SA with public authority. I put uh, in that uh, uh, statute, it's PS 1395, and becomes 252. He acquired wide legislative powers, as has already been seen from the extract which I have read from the uh, Nazi yearbook of 1941. Uh, I would uh, particularly uh, draw the attention of the, uh, the tribunal to a decree of Hitler's dated the 27th of July. Uh, the extract which I uh, wish to quote is set out in the trial brief. Uh, it has already been read and therefore I will do nothing now other than to draw the attention of the tribunal to it. The document is D138 and has been put in as US 403. 
by the law for the protection of people and state of November 1933, it will be remembered that uh, Hitler and his cabinet uh, obtained for themselves full powers of legislation uh, independently of the Reichstag. And uh, this defendant, being a member of the cabinet, of course, shared in those powers. Uh, his approval of that procedure can be seen from a speech that he made on the 16th of January, 1937. And a short extract is again set out in the trial brief the tribunal have before them. National Socialism has seen to it that vital necessities of our nation can today no longer be talked to pieces by a Reichstag and made the object of the haggling of parties. You have seen that in the new government, decisions of historic scope are made by the Führer and his cabinet, decisions by which in other countries must be preceded by parliamentary debates lasting weeks and weeks. That uh, these powers, and I beg your pardon, uh, that, is, that last extract is taken from uh, a document PS 2426, which becomes 253. Uh, that uh, these uh, powers and offices were in no way a sinecure uh, is clear from Hesse's own order, uh, which uh, he issued in October 1934. Uh, I will not read it now because it has already been read. It is D139 and was put in as US 404. And the tribunal will remember that he is there issuing a decree saying that he has been given the right to participate in legislation by the Führer uh, and any office uh, that is proposing legislation and in which he therefore ought to take part must let him have the drafts in time to take effective action on them if he disapproves of them. I think, again, the extract that I have read, and read from the yearbook um, sufficiently describes the powers that he had without my referring to more than two other documents upon this matter. Uh, on page five of the trial brief, it will be seen uh, that uh, he acquired powers uh, and took part in the organization and production under the four-year plan. I quote from a lecture given by the defendant Frick on the 7th of March, 1940, which is PS 2608 and has already been put in as 714, but the short passage that I quote now was not actually read. In that lecture, Frick said, in order to guarantee the coordination of the various economic agencies, in order to guarantee the coordina coordination of the various economic agencies of the four-year plan, those agencies were formed into a general council under the chairmanship of Goering. Its members are the state secretaries of the agencies working in the field of war economy, the chief of the military office of economy, and a representative of the deputy of the Führer. And uh, lastly, a quotation from the National Saito of the 27th of April, 1941, which is M102, and becomes GB254. Although well, it appears on page four of the trial brief. I, 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 I quote from the, these passages set out simply to save the tribunal's time in referring to the document book 
It does appear on page 12 of the document, if the tribunal desire to refer to the full extract. A long while ago, <coughs> it was still before the outbreak of war, Rudolf Hess was once called the conscience of the party. If we ask why the Führer's deputy was given this undoubtedly honorable title, the reason for this is plain to see. There is no phenomenon of our public life which is not the concern of the Führer's deputy. So enormously many-sided and diverse is his work and sphere of duty that it cannot be outlined in a few words. And it lies in the nature of the obligation laid on the Führer's deputy that wide publicity hears little of the activity of Rudolf Hess. Few know that many government measures taken, especially in the sphere of war, economy, and the party, meet, which, which meet with such hearty approbation when they are notified publicly, can be traced back to the direct initiation of the Führer's deputy. <coughs> Perhaps I ought to just remind the tribunal that in the, in the uh, decree appointing a secret cabinet council, uh, that council was appointed by Hitler to advise him in the conduct of foreign policy. <coughs> The tribunal will find attached to their document book a few photos. They are of little importance. They were really to emphasize uh, or remind the tribunal of the film uh, that was shown earlier uh, in the course of these proceedings, when it will be remembered that the defendant Hess appeared in practically every scene of that film of the rise of <coughs> power of the Nazi party. These photographs are not actually photographs from that film. There are others somewhat similar, and I produce an affidavit with them to state that they were taken by uh, Hitler's own private photographer. That affidavit becomes GB255. Perhaps I might be allowed to make one short submission upon that. I make it in respect of this defendant, Hess, although it is perhaps a, a submission which uh, can be made in respect of every one of these defendants. The prosecution <coughs> have uh, presented these cases against the individual defendants <coughs> in the form of a collection of uh, the documents which directly refer to and uh, which directly connect these defendants with uh, specific instances <coughs> of participation in the various crimes that were committed by the German people. My Lord, it would be my submission uh, that uh, it is sufficient to justify and bring home the conviction of this man and his colleagues to produce simply evidence of their positions in the Nazi state and in control of that state uh, and also the general evidence of the crimes which were committed by the German people. It is only perhaps now, at this late <coughs> stage in the trial, as day by day the extent and scope of those crimes uh, is becoming clear, uh, that we realize that they <coughs> cannot have happened by themselves. Uh, crime on that scale must be organized coordinated and directed. If the government of Nazi Germany or the government of any country is not the organization which directs and coordinates it, what is? And if the members of that government and the people who control <coughs> and give orders to the members of the German nation who are committing those crimes are not the people responsible for them, then in my submission one is entitled to ask, who is? No, there is no question, and there can be no question either, that these men had knowledge 
Again, as the picture unfolds, it would be my submission that everybody in Germany must have had knowledge what was going on. And if everybody had knowledge, then my submission, these men must certainly have had knowledge. Uh, uh, and I would urge upon this tribunal the fact that the conviction of these men does not rely upon the mere chance of how many documents happen to have been captured bearing their signature. It may well have been, it might well have been, that no documents at all had been captured. But in the submission of the prosecution, these men could equally well and equally justifiably <coughs> have been proved guilty of the part they took beyond any kind of doubt upon the evidence of the positions that they held and the evidence of the scope and extent of the crimes that were committed by the people they controlled. Well, Lord, that is my submission. And uh, in view of that, uh, I, I would perhaps deal <coughs> briefly for the convenience of the tribunal with the small matters, the many matters, which do directly connect him with, as I say, almost every aspect of the crimes and life of Nazi Germany. I turn to page six of the trial brief. Rechtsanwalt Dr. Alfred Seidel, Verteidiger des Angeklagten Rudolf Hess. Es wurde soeben vom Herrn Anklagevertreter eine alte staatliche Versicherung erwähnt. Es wurde soeben vom Herrn Anklagevertreter eine alte staatliche Versicherung erwähnt, die die Nummer GB 255 bekommen hat. Ich vermag diese alte staatliche Versicherung weder im Dreilbrief noch in dem Dokumentenbuch zu finden. Ich kann daher nicht zu der alte staatlichen Versicherung Stellung nehmen, und kann insbesondere nicht die Frage prüfen, ob gegen diese Versicherung irgendwelche Bedenken in Bezug auf die Vorschriften des Statuts zu erheben sind. Ich bitte den Herrn Anklagevertreter daher aufzugeben, dass mir diese alte staatliche Versicherung vorgelegt wird. It's rather difficult to hear the translation coming through. Herr Präsident, ich weiß nicht, wie weit die Übersetzung gegangen ist. Ganz gar nicht. Überhaupt nicht. Enough. Well, go on. Ja. Ich weiß nicht, Herr Präsident, wie viel Sie überhaupt übersetzt bekommen erhalten haben. Well, uh, there's some document that you're saying is not in the document book. I am entirely to blame. Uh, the photographs were in the book. The uh, affidavit by the photographer was by mistake omitted from the book. Uh, it, the original is here. I will uh, produce a copy for uh, Mr. Seidel, and uh, I regret that it wasn't done before. It wasn't a very important document. I'm afraid. <laughs> My Lord, as might be expected, in the positions that he held, the defendant Hess took uh, a leading part in the acquisition uh, of power by the Nazi party and in their consolidation of control over the state. Uh, by the uh, law uh, of uh, the 1st of August, the office of uh, Reich President... 1934, you mean? I beg your pardon, 1934. Uh, the office of Reich President uh, and of Reich Chancellor were joined together uh, under Hitler. Hitler uh, held both offices. 
uh, that decree was signed uh, by others uh, and by Hess. Uh, Hess also signed a decree on the 20th of December 1934, a decree entitled Laws on Treacherous Acts and Against the State and Party, <coughs> Uh, by uh, Article 1 uh, of that <coughs> decree, penalties were imposed upon anybody making false statements, injuring the prestige of the government, the party, or its agencies. And uh, by Article 2, penalties were imposed for statements proving a malicious attitude against the party or its leading personalities. <coughs> the decree was signed by Hess, and it was Hess uh, who had to issue the necessary regulations for carrying the decree into effect. He took a leading part in the uh, gaining of control over government appointments. I quote uh, again in all these matters only a few examples if one was to quote every decree that the defendant signed and every act that he took in participation of these matters, it would really entail writing a history of the Nazi party from 1920 until 1941 and a history of Germany from 1933 until 1941. Uh, set out uh, in the trial brief at page 7, it will be seen uh, that there are various decrees, all signed by Hess, of the 24th of September 1935, a decree providing for his consultation in the appointment of Russian civil servants, 3rd of April 1936, providing for his participation in the appointment of labor service officials, And uh, I refer again to the 10th of July, another decree, 10th of July 1937, another decree under which he participated by having to be consulted up, uh, upon the appointment of other minor civil servants. <coughs> With respect to the control that the Nazi party gained over the German youth. Again, there are various decrees signed by this defendant. And uh, I set out in the trial brief particularly a reference to uh, the book which has already been put in, Votes's uh, Dates of the Nazi Party, where it appears that he appointed a university commission of the party, which was under his supervision, and the tribunal will remember that that has already, we have already seen from the chart of his staff, that he had a department dealing with universities and with teachers. And uh, quoting from the same document, on the 18th of July, 1934, the Nazi League of German Students was uh, directly subordinated to the deputy of the Führer. The uh, defendant, uh, as the tribunal has heard, was an Obergruppenführer himself in the SS and in the SA. Uh, his uh, responsibility for and association uh, with those organizations can be seen from <coughs> three uh, documents. <coughs> Amongst the papers found in the Krupp files was a circular sent by Hess, apparently to various industries, asking for funds for the, or subscriptions, for the Adolf Hitler Fund for German industry. 
The document is D151, which I put in now as GB256. And uh, the relevant extract again is set out in the trial brief for convenience. The fund rests upon an agreement between the Reich management of the NSDAP and leading representatives of German industry. And then its purpose is set out to put at the disposal of the Reich leadership the funds required for the unified execution of the tasks which fall to the lot of the SA, SS and other political or or organizations. He signed a decree on the 9th of June 1934 Lord, for the convenience of the tribunal, perhaps I ought to mention that that last document that I mentioned can be found at page five of the document book. On the 9th of June, 1934, he signed a decree uh, by which the uh, security service of the Reichsführer SS was established as the sole political news and defense service of the party. And on the uh, 14th of December, 1938, he uh, issued another decree by which the SD, which Himmler had established, was taken on the establishment of the party, uh, and it was under that decree to be organized by the SS. Those were both Hess decrees, same document, PS 3385, they become at GB257, and they appear at page 172 of the tribunal's document book. My Lord, there has already been given much evidence uh, of the subversion of the churches in order to eliminate any hostile parties there may have been to the Nazi party. Hess again took his share in that legislation and uh, there are set out in the uh, trial brief on pages eight and nine a series of decrees which have already been put before the tribunal during the presentation of the case against Bormann. Bormann, it will be remembered, was at this time uh, and throughout until Hess flew to England, Hess's deputy. And uh, therefore, uh, it would be my submission that decrees issued by Bormann as deputy for the deputy of the Führer uh, are, of course, the responsibility of this defendant as well. Uh, (coughs) For the sake of time, I leave it. The tribunal has a reference the decrees, and will bear the mind, uh, in mind the uh, evidence that was offered uh, against the defendant Gorman. I come now then to his activity uh, in the general persecution of the Jews. Again, it will be remembered that uh, the chart of his organization showed an office of his Uh, which described itself as the Office for Racial Policy. His own views about this matter are found in a speech which he made on the 16th of January, 1937, and which is reported in a volume of his speeches, which is PS 3124, and becomes... Uh, I beg your pardon, it's already in SGB 253. The extract I desire to quote is set out uh, in the trial brief. The document can be found on page 98 of the document book. The organizations of the NSDAP will be used for the enlightenment of the people in questions concerning the race and health of the nation (coughs) and to increase the population. 
Just as in the homeland, so in foreign lands, Germans influenced in the national socialist sense are being educated in such a way as to make them proudly conscious again of the fact that they are Germans, to make them hold together and esteem each other. Thus they are being educated to put Germans above the subjects of a foreign nation regardless of their position or their origin. Hess it was who signed the law for protection of blood and honor, one of the Nuremberg decrees uh, of the 15th of September 1935. It is uh, PS 3179 is already in evidence as US 200. And it will be remembered that under that decree and under the, Nure the other uh, Reich citizenship law of the same date, it was the uh, deputy of the Führer who was to issue the necessary decrees uh, and uh, regulations for carrying out and supplementing those laws, the Nuremberg decrees. Uh, on the 14th of November, 1935, uh, it was Hess that issued an ordinance under the Reich citizenship law which uh, deprived the Jews of the right to vote or to hold public office. That is a PS 1417 and becomes GB 258. By a further decree of the 20th of May, 1938, uh, those Nuremberg laws were extended to Austria that law of extension again being signed by this defendant. PS 2124, GB 259. As I said, those are only a few examples of uh, the uh, decrees and activities of this man, ma man in the uh, acquisition of power and consolidation of power of the Nazi party. Uh, there is a, a, which I would hand up, uh, I would hand copies to the tribunal, which perhaps they might add to their document books. Um, and there is a copy in German for the uh, learned French judge. Uh, there's a copy in German. A list of other exhibits which I have not mentioned now but which are already before the tribunal put in when the case of Berman was put before the tribunal which as I've already said uh, this defendant uh, must take responsibility and you will see that under various headings uh, now they're not there the, are the one or two German copies, and the rest are in English. There are various documents set out there under the headings Association with the SD and Gestapo, Subversion of the Churches, and uh, again, the Persecution of the Jews. I turn then to the part that he played in the actual planning and preparation of aggressive war. Uh, we find uh, as early as 1932, he was concerned with the rearmament and reorganization of the Air Force. The tribunal will remember a document, PS 1143, US 40, dated the 20th of October, 1932, uh, which showed that a report on the preparation of material and the training of air personnel uh, to provide for the armament of the Air Force uh, was sent to Hess by Rosenberg's chief of staff. 
Uh, that document for uh, reference appears on page 43 of the tribunal's document book. That was in 1932. Throughout the years, we find him connected with, with the rearmament uh, of the German armed forces. On the 16th of March, 1935, it was Hess that signed the decree for the introduction of compulsory military service. On the uh, 12th of October, 1936, uh, in a speech that he made, he took up Goering's cry of guns before butter uh, when he said, we are prepared in the future too, if need be, at times to eat a little less fat, a little less pork, a few eggs less, since we know that this little sacrifice is a sacrifice on the altar of the freedom of our people. We know that the foreign exchange, which we thereby save, expedites the output of armaments. The phrase still holds good today, guns instead of butter. That document is M104. It becomes 260 and will be found <coughs> on page 14 of the tribunal's document book. In May of 1941, he was making a speech at the Messerschmitt works, uh, of which occasion the tribunal have already got a photograph before them. It was one of those four photographs that we were looking at a moment ago. And then he said, the German soldier must understand for the uniqueness and abundance of his weapons and his material. For these, he must thank the untiring efforts for many years of Adolf Hitler. The report of that speech appears in the Volkischer Berbacht of the 2nd of May, 1941. It is M105 and becomes GB261. It is on page 15 of the tribunal's document book. One of the most important uh, parts that this defendant took in the preparation for aggressive war uh, was his organization uh, of the famous German Fifth Column. Uh, he was uh, the uh, responsible person as deputy to the Führer of the Auslands organization of the party, that is to say the foreign organization of the party. A history of that organization will be found, a very brief history, will be found uh, in a, uh, an American state publication, uh, PS 3258, becomes 261 GB, I beg your pardon, 262 GB. It is on page 147 of the document book, but I would only mention now uh, two matters. In October 1933, uh, that organization was placed directly under Hesse's control. And uh, uh, a year later, it was Hess himself who gave it its uh, present name uh, of the foreign organization, Iceland's organization. For the convenience again of the tribunal, a chart is set out in the organization book uh, for 1938, which is uh, PS 2354 US 430 and is on page 69 of the uh, tribunal's document book. But I think it unnecessary to refer now uh, in detail. Uh, it had its various office, offices, civil service office, cultural office, press and propaganda offices, a labor front office, and a foreign trade office. And it had various offices dealing with the German merchant marine, uh, which afforded, of course, an excellent medium for spreading Nazi propaganda to every port throughout the world. The tribunal has heard a good deal about a somewhat similar organization of Rosenberg's, the APA, uh, very briefly and in a word, I think the distinction between the two can be said to be that 
the APA was concerned The APA was concerned with uh, the enrollment and propaganda for non-Germans. Understand? For, for foreigners. Is that working now? Is that working? Is that all right? Uh, the APA was concerned with foreigners, whereas the uh, Auslands organization was concerned with Germans living abroad, uh, who of course were to form the basis of fifth column activities in future years. Uh, I think the tribunal will see that there are set out under the heading scope of the organization's work. Um, I think perhaps it is sufficient to refer to the first of them now, uh, PS 3401, which becomes 263 GB and which the tribunal will find on page 173 of their document book. Oh, uh, brief. Page 12, my lord. <coughs> that is a, a, an article from the Volkische Berbachter, uh, which uh, it starts off by saying that national socialist, uh, socialism is an ideology which takes hold of our fellow Germans and strengthens them in holding fast to the German nature and customs. Uh, and uh, it then goes on uh, to say that the place for the practical <laughs> application uh, uh, of that uh, policy and principle is the foreign organization of the NSDAP, which is directly subordinate to the deputy of the Führer, Hess. I quote the last three lines of that paragraph. The work of the foreign organization is literally extended over the entire earth, and the following slogan could with full justice be displayed in its workrooms in Hamburg. My field is the world. Foreign organization under the leadership of Gauleiter Bohl, who is aided by a large staff of experts and qualified co-workers, today includes over 350 national groups and bases of the NSDAP in all parts of the world. And in addition to this, takes care of a large number of individual party comrades in most varied places. Lord, in view of the time, uh, I, I will not refer to any further documents about the uh, activity and scope of that organization. They will be found as set out in the following document, PS 3258, uh, which is at page 150 of the document book. That becomes GB 264. I beg your pardon, it's 262 already. And there is another uh, extract from the British Foreign Office Basic Handbook on Germany, which uh, uh, is in the, the addendum to the document book. It's not, I think, uh, actually put into the tribunal's brief. It appears under the exhibit number M122 and becomes GB264. Two of the various other organizations which were run by the foreign organizations 
were known as the National League for Germandom Abroad, the VDA, and the German Eastern League, the BDO. I would refer the tribunal to a document which uh, they will find on page 38 of the document book. It's PS 837, which becomes GB 265. And that is a letter uh, which uh, it will be seen on the next page is signed by Hess dated the 3rd of February, 1939. It's a circular order, not for publication. The subject is the National League of Germans Abroad and the German Eastern League. I quote from the first paragraph, the director of the Agency for Racial Germans, uh, SS Gruppenführer Lorenz, the Agency for Racial Germans, which was the Volksdeutsch Mittelstell, was uh, another uh, similar foreign organization, uh, but one run by Himmler and the SS. All these gentlemen appear to have had their own uh, foreign organizations. No doubt they were all engaged upon the same purpose. Himmler's was called the Volksdeutsch Mittelstell. It, uh, I quote again, the director for that agency has instigated on my behalf the following new ruling for questions affecting racial work and work in the border country. The National League for Germans Abroad, the VDA, in uh, is the association responsible for national work beyond the frontiers. I go down to the last two lines of that paragraph the VDA is organized into state associations which correspond in area to the GAUs of the NSDAP. And the first two lines of the next paragraph, the German Eastern League, the BDO, is the association responsible for work on the border country. And I turn the next page to paragraph four of that letter, number four, the VDA is solely responsible for racial work beyond the frontiers. I herewith forbid the party, its organizations, and affiliated associations from all racial work abroad. The only competent body for this task is the Agency for Racial Germans and the VDA as its camouflage too. Within the Reich, the VDA, generally speaking, is responsible only for providing the means for racial work beyond the frontiers. VDA must be supported in this in every way by the party officers. Any outward appearance of connection with the party is, however, to be avoided. And then it goes on to set out the activities of the BDO. And uh, the last paragraph, the activity of the BDO and the VDA is to be supported in every way by the party offices the national socialist leadership of both associations will ensure energetic cooperation on their part in all tasks assigned to them by the NSDAP. Their nature is determined by considerations of foreign policy and the associations must bear this in mind when representing them in public. Lord, I turn from uh, the activities, therefore, of the foreign organization as I say, was the basis of the fifth column movement when war eventually broke, up, broke out. I pass then to consideration of Hesse's part uh, in uh, the preliminary uh, occupation, uh, occupations of Austria and Czechoslovakia, which led up to the aggressive wars themselves. Uh, Hess uh, is seen to be participating in the preparations to occupy Austria from the very beginning. In uh, the autumn of 1934, it was he that appointed Reintaler 
as leader of the Austrian peasants, the Nazi party in Austria, after the failure of the July 1934 rising. That has already been given in evidence, PS 812, US 61, and uh, the relevant passage was read into the transcript at page 504. Another document that has already been put in evidence, PS 3254, US 704, is Sice Inquart's statement of the 10th of December, uh, 1945, when he mentions that he <coughs> held meetings with Goering and Hess in 1936. On the morning that the German troops eventually marched into Austria, 12th of March, 1938, uh, Hess and Himmler together were the first of the leaders of the uh, German government uh, to appear in Vienna, and they were there by midday on that day. It was Hess who signed the law on the 13th of March next day for the reunion of Austria with the German Reich. And the tribunal will no doubt remember the occasion which was described fully by Mr. Alderman uh, of the shocking celebrations which were held in anniversary of the murder of Dolphus. Celebrations being held the 24th of July, 1938, uh, when the highlight of the occasion was a speech by Hess. I would refer the tribunal to a document which appears on page 165 of the document book, which uh, throws some light in his own words, both on his activities so far as Austria was concerned, and also with Czechoslovakia. This was a speech that he made on the 28th of August, 1938, at the annual meeting of the Foreign Organization. It is PS 3258. It's already in as 262 GB. And I quote from the... Uh, third but last paragraph on page 165 of the document book. At the close of his talk, Rudolf Hess recalls the days last year in Stuttgart when German men and women, German boys and girls in their native co co costumes, appeared here in Stuttgart, aglow with enthusiasm for the idea of a greater Germany, passionately moved by national socialism, but nevertheless outwardly Volksdeutsch. <laughs> Germans of foreign citizenship. Today, Rudolf Hess continued, they also stand openly in our ranks. Proudly and happily, they will march in the formations of the National Socialist Movement past their Führer in Nuremberg, this time as German citizens. With all our hearts, we rejoice to see them. They have fought a long and tough battle, a battle against a treacherous and mendacious enemy, <coughs> and so on. And then on to the next page, 166, where he turns to discuss the struggle of the Sudeten Germans. The German people looks at the German racial comrades in Czechoslovakia with the profoundest sympathy for their suffering. No one in the world who loves his own people and is proud of his own people will find fault with us if from this place here we also turn our thoughts to the Sudeten Germans. If we say to them that filled with admiration, we see how they are maintaining an iron discipline, despite the worst chicanery, despite terror and murder. If it had in general required a proof, I don't think perhaps it's necessary for me to read any more of that document. But it shows, as I say, his interest in Czechoslovakia, and by a document PS 3061, which has already been put in as US 126, <coughs> it has been shown that during the summer of 1938, 
That speech was made in August of 1938. During the whole of that summer, continuous conversations were being held between Henlein and Hitler, Hess and Ribbentrop, informing the Reich government of the general situation in Czechoslovakia. That document has been read uh, into the transcript at page 932 of the transcript. But if uh, anything condemns Hess as participating in this action, uh, it is a letter dated the 27th of September 1938, uh, which was a letter, it will be remembered, the tribunal had it before them, uh, written by Keitel to Hess asking for the party's participation in the secret mobilization which was intended to take place without even issuing the code word for mobilization. That was on the 27th of September, 1938. That letter was written. It is PS 388 and has been put in at US, as US 26. And it appears on page 30 of the tribunal's document book for them. I would refer the tribunal to uh, one short <coughs> document on page 120 of the do document book. Again, it's another speech by the defendant, a speech he made on the 7th of November 1938 on the occasion of the initiation of the Sudeten German party into the NSDAP. <coughs> If we had had to defend our rights, then they would really have got to know us, we the National Socialist Germans. The Führer, he declared amid the ringing cheers of the masses, learnt his lesson. He armed at a speed that no one would have believed possible. When the Führer has gained the power, and more especially since the Führer has awakened the resolution of the German people to put their strength behind their rights, then Germany's rights will be conceded. <coughs> One might wonder what all those rights were at that time, November 1938, when already uh, Hitler had said on the 26th of September that year, that he had no more territorial demands, at any rate, to make in Europe. I turn then to his part, or some fragment of evidence of the part he played in the uh, waging of an aggressive war against Poland. On page 16 of the document book, uh, there is a, a report of a speech that he made on the 27th of August, 1939, which shows at least that he was <coughs> taking part in the official propaganda that was being thrown at the world in those days a few days before war was declared. I quote from the second paragraph, Rudolf Hess, constantly interrupted with strong applause from the uh, German citizens living abroad, as well as fellow countrymen from the district of Styria, stressed the unexampled forbearance shown by Germany towards Poland and the magnanimous offer of the Führer that would have endured peace between Germany and Poland an offer that Mr. Chamberlain seems to have forgotten. For he says he has heard nothing of Germany's having tried to solve certain acute present-day questions by peaceful discussion. What else was the German offer than if it was not such an attempt? Then he goes on to accuse Poland of agitating for war and so on. The rep responsibility for Poland's lack, for the, the responsibility for Poland's lack of responsibility is England. Well, uh, in view of the time, again, I, I shall quote no more of that. The document is in evidence. And uh, 
it becomes GB266. After the conquest of Poland, it was Hess that uh, signed the decree incorporating Danzig into the Reich, decree of the 1st of September 1939, uh, a decree incorporating Polish territories into the Reich on the 8th of October 1939, and on the 12th of October 1939, a decree <coughs> for the administration of Polish territories, in which it was stated that regulations were to be made for the planning of German Lebensraum and economic scope. Now those are, are all decrees in the Reich Gazette Blatt. I regret that the last two that I mentioned are not actually included in the tribunal's document book, but uh, the effect of them is set out in the trial brief. That, uh, in view of the evidence that has been given as to his fifth column organization, is all that I propose to offer in respect of Poland. It must be clear, my submission would be, that he was deeply involved both in the planning and in the preparation for aggressive war. I turn to uh, an example of his uh, participation in uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity, and I would refer only to two documents. Uh, one uh, which appears is set out uh, on page 18 of the trial brief, PS 3245, which becomes GB 267. It was an order issued by Hess through, his cha the, through the party chancellery demanding support for the, uh, from the party for recruiting <coughs> members for the Waffen SS. A and uh, one uh, paragraph which is set out in the trial brief, uh, I quote, the units of the Waffen-SS consisting of national socialists are more suitable than other armed units for the specific tasks to be solved in the occupied Eastern Territories due to their intensive national socialist training in regard to questions of race and nationality. Well, in view of what was happening and what was going to happen, uh, in the uh, occupied Eastern Territories by the Waffen-SS. We haven't, I, I know, forgotten the part they played in the destruction of Warsaw Ghetto. I suggest the inference that can be drawn from that letter is damning. And there is one further document. That document, I might say, will be found on page 121 of the Tribunal's document book. You may pass it the other document that I ref would refer to in respect, uh, in this respect, is R uh, R96, which becomes GB268, and again that will be found on page 175 of the document book. It's a letter written by the Reich Minister of Justice to uh, the uh, Chief of the Reich Chancellery on the 17th of April, 1941, and it is uh, discussing proposed penal laws for Jews and Poles in the occupied Eastern Territories. Uh, it shows quite clearly that Hess has been involved in discussions on this subject because it refers to certain proposals that uh, he himself has made. Lord, I would venture to draw the attention of the tribunal to one or two passages. <coughs> I quote from the beginning of that letter on page 175. It has been my opinion from the outset that special conditions prevailing in the annexed Eastern Territories require special measures of penal law and penal procedure against Poles and Jews. And then I go on to the second paragraph. 
first two lines. The aim to create a special law for Poles and Jews in the Eastern Territories was pursued further according to plan by the ordinance dated the 6th of June 1940. By this ordinance, German penal law, which had been used in the Eastern Territories already from the outset, was formally made applicable. Then I skip three lines. The procedure for enforcing a prosecution has been abrogated, for it seems intolerable that Poles or Jews should be able to force the German public prosecutor to instigate an indictment. Poles and Jews have also been deprived of the right to prosecute in their own names or to join the public prosecutor in an action. In addition to this special law in the sphere of law of procedure, some special conditions have been included in Article 2 of the Introductory Ordinance. These provisions were established in agreement with the Reich Minister for the Interior on the basis of needs which had made themselves felt. From the beginning, it was intended to augment these special conditions in case of need. This need, which had become apparent in the meantime, was met by an executive and, ex and supplementary order which was added to the original ordinance and which was referred to in the letter from the deputy's Führer. I turn to the next page. The top of the page, later I was informed of the express wish of the Führer as a matter of principle, the Poles, and I presume the Jews, are to be, be treated differently from the Germans within the sphere of penal law. After preliminary discussions, etc., I drew up the enclosed draft concerning criminal law and procedure against Poles and Jews. The draft represents, I go to the next paragraph, the draft represents an altogether special law both in the sphere of penal law and penal procedure. The suggestions of the deputy Führer uh, have been taken into consideration to a far-reaching extent. Number one, paragraph three, contains a general crime formula on the basis of which any Pole or Jew in the Eastern Territories can in future be prosecuted and any kind of punishment can be inflicted on him for any attitude or action which is considered punishable and is directed against German. And then I go to the next paragraph. In accordance with the opinion of the deputy of the Führer, I started from the point of view that the Pole is less susceptible to infliction of ordinary imprisonment. And a, a few lines further down, under these new kinds of punishment, the prisoners are to be lodged outside prisons in camps and are to be forced to do heavy and heaviest labor. I go to the next page, second paragraph, the introduction of corporal punishment, which the deputy of the Führer has brought up for discussion, has not been included in the draft. I cannot agree to this type of punishment because its infliction does not, in my opinion, correspond to the cultural level of the German people. Um, Lord, uh, as I say, the purpose of that document is to show that the deputy of the Führer was well aware of what was going on in the Eastern occupied territories and indeed was advocating even stronger measures than the Reich Minister of Justice was prepared to accept. I turn then uh, to uh, give uh, such evidence as I can upon the flight of the defendant Hess to England on the 10th of May. On the 10th of May, 1941. Uh, on that evening, he landed in Scotland, quite close, within 12 miles of the home of the Duke of Hamilton. And on landing, he uh, at once asked uh, to uh, be taken to the Duke of Hamilton, whom he wanted to see. He gave a false name and was uh, shut up. And uh, on the following day, the 11th of May, he uh, had an interview with the Duke of Hamilton, a report of which 
is set out in the addendum to the document book. If the tribunal would now turn to the small addendum to the document book. <coughs> Has this been put in evidence yet or not? Um, uh, I'm, I'm putting it in evidence. Is it uh, properly authenticated? It is authenticated and the original uh, is certified as being a government report from the files of the Foreign Office in London. There are various... There are four reports altogether which come from the Foreign Office files and which have been certified as uh, reports from those files. The first one that I would refer to is M116, which becomes GB269, and that is the report a big one. I, I, I repeat that again. I refer to M116, which becomes GB269, and is a report on the interview that he had with the Duke of Hamilton on the 11th of May, 1941. I can summarize uh, uh, most of the contents of that report by saying that he introduced himself as Hess. Uh, he said that uh, he had met uh, the Duke of Hamilton at the Olympic Games in 1936, uh, that his old uh, friend, Hauschofer, under whom he uh, studied at Munich University after the last war, had suggested uh, that he, Hess, should uh, make contact with the Duke of Hamilton. And he said that in order to do so, he had already tried to fly three times before, the first being in December uh, of uh, 1940, previous year. The reasons he then gave for his visit will be found on the second page of that document, I quote from the end of the fourth line. I beg your pardon. Uh, perhaps I ought to say really before that, uh, he, he said that he had said earlier in the interview that Germany was willing for peace with England. She was certain to <coughs> win the war and he himself was anxious to stop the unnecessary slaughter that would otherwise inevitably take place. He asked me if I could get together leading members of my party to talk over things with a view to making peace proposals. I replied that there was now only one party in this country. He then said he could tell me what Hitler's peace terms would be First, he would insist on an arrangement whereby our two countries would never go to war again. I questioned him as to how that arrangement could be brought about, and he replied that one of the conditions, of course, is that Britain would give up her traditional policy of always opposing the strongest power in Europe. I think I need really read no more of that document because he enlarges upon those uh, proposals in the subsequent interviews that he had on the 13th, 14th, and 15th of May uh, with Mr. Kirkpatrick uh, of the Foreign Office. I turn to M117, which becomes 270, which is uh, another official report of the interview with Mr. Kirkpatrick on the 13th of May. Again, I can summarize uh, 
practically all of it. He uh, <coughs> started off by explaining the chain of circumstances which led up to his present situ situation, which uh, really involved uh, a history of uh, Europe from the end of the last war up to that time. He uh, dealt with Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Norway, uh, saying in each case that Germany was justified and it was all England's and France's fault that they had had to go in. Uh, he blamed England entirely for starting the war. Uh, he did uh, say, and I quote one line, which is of interest, uh, dealing with Munich. He said, the intervention of Mr. Chamberlain. Uh, I'm reading from one, two, three, four, fifth, the fifth uh, paragraph, uh, my lord, starts off the Czechoslovakia crisis was caused by the French determin determination expressed by the French air minister to make Czechoslovakia an air base against Germany. It was Hitler's duty to scotch this plot. The intervention of Mr. Chamberlain and the Munich conference had been a source of great relief to Hitler. One remembers somewhere having heard Hitler saying that he had never, of course, any intention of abiding by that agreement at all. That would never do. Uh, well, I, 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 I go on with that document. Uh, he uh, then says that Germany must win the war. He says that the bombing of England had only just started, and only just started like, with the greatest reluctance. He puts it top of page two. The uh, German production of U-boats was enormous. They had enormous raw material sources <laughs> in occupied territory. And uh, the confidence in Hitler and in the subsequent, uh, subsequent in the final victory uh, in Germany was complete and that there was no kind of hope for any revolution amongst the German people. He gave his reasons for his flight, his personal reasons, again, that he was horrified at the prospect of a long war. England could not win, and therefore she had better make peace now. He said the Fuhrer entertained no designs against England. He had no idea of world domination, and uh, he would greatly regret the collapse of the British Empire. I quote from uh, the last three lines of uh, the large paragraph in the center of the page. Uh, at this point, Hess tried to make my flesh creep by emphasizing that the avaricious Americans had fell designs upon the empire. Canada would certainly be incorporated into the United States. Reverting to Hitler's attitude, he said that only as recently as May the 3rd, after his Reichstag speech, Hitler had declared to him that he had no oppressive demands to make upon England. A solution which her Hess proposed, the solution which her Hess proposed, was that England should give Germany a free hand in Europe, and Germany would give England a completely free hand in the empire, with the sole reservation that we should return Germany's ex-colonies, which she required as a source of raw materials. I asked, in order to draw him on the subject of Hitler's attitude to Russia, whether he included Russia in Europe or in Asia. He replied, in Asia. I then retorted that under the terms of his proposal, since Germany would, have, would only have a free hand in Europe, she would not be at liberty to attack Russia. Her Hess reacted quickly by remarking that Germany had certain demands to make of Russia which would have to be satisfied either by negotiation or as the result of a war. He added, however, that there was no foundation for the rumors now being spread that Hitler was contemplating 
an early attack on Russia. I then asked about Italian names, and he said that he did not know. I replied that it was a matter of some importance. He brushed this aside and said that he was sure that Italy's claims would not be excessive. I su su suggested that Italy scarcely deserved anything, but he begged to differ. Italy had rendered considerable services to Germany, and besides, England had compensated defeat defeated nations like Romania after the last war. Finally, as we were leaving the room, her Hess delivered a parting shot. He had forgotten, he declared, to emphasize that the proposal could only be considered on the understanding that it was negotiated by Germany with an English government, other than the present British government. Mr. Churchill, who had planned the war since 1936, and his colleagues who had lent themselves to his war policy, were not persons with whom the Fuhrer could negotiate. Nor it is presumably, when he came over, he was not attempting to be funny. And one can only conclude from these reports that at that time, the people in Germany and the German government really had no kind of idea of what the conditions in England were like at all. But throughout it appears that this man thought that England was ruled by Churchill and a, a small warmongering gang. It only, met, only needed him to come over, make a peace proposal, for Churchill to be turned out in the course of two or three days. I go on then to the next document. Lord, I, 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 I'm afraid that it's now half past. I have only the other reports and one further document to refer the tribunal to. I'm sorry that it should have taken. <laughs> uh, I go on to the next interview of the 14th of May, uh, which uh, is M118 and becomes 271. He started off that interview by making certain complaints about his treatment, asking for a number of things, including three men in a boat, the book, which perhaps is one of the few signs that any of these defendants have shown of any kind of culture or normal feelings at all. He described his flight to England. And then I quote from the third paragraph. He then passed a political question. He said that on reflection, he had omitted to explain that there were two further conditions attached to his peace proposals. First, Germany could not leave Iraq in the lurch. The Iraqis had fought for Germany, and Germany would therefore have to require us to evacuate Iraq. I observed that this was going considerably beyond the original proposal that German interests should be confined to Europe, but he retorted that, taken as a whole, his proposals were more than fair. The second condition was that the peace agreement should contain a provision for the reciprocal indemnification of British and German nationals whose property had been expropriated as the result of the war. Herr Hess concluded by saying that he wished to impress on us that Germany must win the war by bouquet. We had no conception of the number of submarines now building in Germany. Hitler always did things on a grand scale. <coughs> and devastating submarine war, supported by new types of aircraft, would very shortly succeed in establishing a completely effective blockade <coughs> of England. It was fruitless for anyone here to imagine that England could capitulate and that the war be waged from the empire. <coughs> it was Hitler's intention, in such an eventuality, to continue to blockade, to continue the blockade of England, even though the island had capitulated, so that we would have to face the deliberate starvation of the population of these islands. <coughs> I 
I think uh, I can leave then that um, interview. Nothing more was added. And uh, turn to the next document, M119, which becomes 272 of the interview of the 15th of May, the third and last interview uh, with Mr. Kirkpatrick. I quote the, from the third paragraph. I then, uh, there was some mention of Iraq again at the beginning of the interview, and then uh, Mr. Kirkpatrick writes, I then flew a fly over him about Ireland. He's, he said that in all his talks with Hitler, the subject of Ireland had never been mentioned, except incidentally. Ireland had done nothing for Germany in this war, and it was therefore to be supposed that Hitler would not concern himself in Anglo-Irish relations. We had some little conversation about the difficulty of reconciling the wishes of the South and the North, and from this we passed to American interest in Ireland, and so to America. On the subject of America, Hess took the following lie. The Germans reckoned with American intervention and were not afraid of it. They knew all about American aircraft production and the quality of the aircraft. Germany could outbuild England and America combined. Germany had no designs on America. The so-called German peril was a ludicrous figment of the imagination. Hitler's interests were European. If we made peace now, Europe would be furious. America would be furious. America rarely wanted to inherit the British Empire. Hess concluded by saying that Hitler rarely wanted a permanent understanding with us on a basis which preserved the empire intact. His own fight was intended to give us a chance of opening conversations without loss of prestige. If we rejected this chance, it would be clear proof he desired no understanding with Germany, and Hitler would be entitled, in fact it would be his duty, to destroy us utterly and keep us after the war in a state of permanent subjection. <coughs> well, Lord, those uh, reports show uh, the substance, and indeed the whole substance, of a uh, the visit. His uh, humanitarian reasons for coming, which sounded so well on the 10th, or between the 10th and the 15th of May, uh, took on quite a different light <coughs> when uh, barely uh, a little more than uh, a month later, uh, Germany attacked the Soviet. One cannot help remembering an exact parallel uh, between uh, this uh, business and that which took place before Germany attacked Poland, when every uh, effort was made to keep England out of the war and so let her fight her battle on one front only. Uh, here, the same thing appears to be happening. And what is more, we have it from himself in the course of those <coughs> interviews that at that time, Germany had no intentions of immediately go, uh, of attacking Russia at all. Well, that must be untrue because uh, it will be remembered and the evidence is set out in note form on page 21 of the brief, the trial brief, it will be remembered that so far back as, 19, as November 1940, there had been plans being made, initial plans, for the invasion of Russia. On the 18th of December 1940, directive ordered preparations to be completed by the 15th of May 1941. On the 3rd of April 1941, Orders were given delaying 
the Barbarossa action for five weeks. And on the 30th of April 1941, 10 days before he arrived in England, D-Day was actually fixed for the invasion of Russia for the 22nd of June. Well now, in my submission, uh, nobody who held the position that this defendant <coughs> did at that time, in charge of the foreign organization, deputy to the Führer, only been made designate successor number two a year ago. Nobody in that position could have been kept in ignorance of those preparations and of those plans. <coughs> Lord, uh, my submission, therefore, is that the only reason he came to England was not humanitarian at all, not humanitarian at all, but uh, purely, as I say, to allow Germany to fight her battle against Russia on one front only. <coughs> there is, uh, uh, and I hesitate to refer the tribunal to any other document, but there is one document which uh, is a document of extreme interest from many points of view and has only just come to light. And uh, I did ask that it should be put in at the back uh, the tribunal's document books, but if it has not been, I have some spare copies which perhaps the very clerk might hand up. It is a, a document PS 1866, which becomes 273. And it is a, an account uh, of uh, conversations between Ribbentrop and uh, Mussolini and uh, Ciano on the 13th of May, 1941, signed by Schmidt. Uh, it carries the question a very little further, but of course the question has existed and still does exist uh, as to whether or not the flight to England was undertaken uh, with the knowledge and approval of Hitler or any other members of the government or on his own initiative and with complete secrecy. He himself has always maintained that he did it secretly. Uh, on the other hand, it's difficult to, 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 to see how he could have been planning it and practicing it for months before and having tried three times before without anybody knowing. Uh, this uh, account of the, uh, uh, of the conversations with the Italians casts little further light on it, but uh, it does show anyway what Ribbentrop is saying to uh, the Italians, their allies, three days later. I would ask the tribunal to uh, look at, to read the first page of this document and a uh, paragraph of the next. Uh, to begin with, the Reich foreign minister conveyed the Führer's greetings to the duchy. He would shortly propose to the duchy a date for the uh, planned meeting. Of, uh, I beg your pardon. He would shortly propose to the duchy a date for the planned meeting, which he would like to take place as soon as possible. As the place for the meeting, he would pr probably prefer the Brenner. At the present moment, he was, as the duchy could well understand, still busy with the Hess affair and with a few military matters. The Duce replied that uh, he would agree with the Führer's proposals and so on. The Reich foreign minister then said that the Führer had sent him to the Duce in order to inform him <coughs> about the Hess affair and the conversation with Admiral Dahlin about the Hess affair. He remarked that the Führer had been completely taken aback by Hess's action and that it had been the action of a lunatic. Hess had been suffering for a long time from a bilious complaint and had fallen into the hands of magnetists and nature cure doctors who allowed his state of health to become worse. All these matters were being investigated at the moment as well as the responsibility of the aide-de-camp who had known about Hess's forbidden flights. Hess had for weeks carried out secret flights in an ME 110 
Naturally, he had acted only from idealistic motives. His being unfaithful to the Fuhrer was utterly out of the question. His conduct had to be explained by a kind of mysticism and a state of mind caused by his illness. And uh, it goes on, and the gist of it really is that uh, Ribbentrop is emphasizing again that uh, it was done without the authority and without the knowledge of Hitler or anybody else in Germany. I say it doesn't carry the matter very much further. Uh, I beg all, I'm, I'm very much obliged. Being sympathetically inclined towards England, Hess had conceived the crazy idea of using England, uh, Great Britain's fascist circles to persuade the British to give in. He had explained all this in a long and confused letter to the Führer. When this letter reached the Führer, Hess was already in England. It was hoped in England that he would perhaps have an accident on, it was hoped in Germany <coughs> that he would perhaps have an accident on the way. But he was now rarely in England and had tried to contact the former Marquis of Clydesdale, the present Duke of Hamilton. Hess quite wrongly considered him as a great friend of Germany and had fl flown to the neighborhood of his castle in Scotland. That's all. I, I yes, I'm very much obliged. I'm very much obliged. refer to the letter. I'm very much obliged. Uh, that is, uh, is what Ribbentrop is saying to Mussolini. Ribbentrop, we know, is a liar. And indeed, the, what he said later in that, interval, uh, that interview proves it. And I would just refer to page five or rather, to the bottom of page four, if the tribunal would bear with me while I uh, read that, because it would have been put in previously during this trial had it been, had this document been known <coughs> of. And as I am putting it in now, perhaps I might be allowed to read this one paragraph which really concerns the defendant ribbon trot. <coughs> the Duce returned to his remark I, I quote the last paragraph on page four. Return to his remark concerning the united front of Europe against England and the two countries, Spain and Russia, that were absent from it, with the remark that, to him, it seemed that it would be advantageous if a policy of collaboration with Russia could be carried out. He asked the Reich's foreign minister whether Germany excluded such a possibility. That is, collaboration with Russia. The Reich foreign minister replied that Germany had other tr had treaties with Russia and that the relations between the two countries were in other respects correct. He personally did not believe that Stalin would undertake anything against Germany. But should he do so, or should he carry out a policy that was intolerable to Germany, then he would be destroyed within three months. The Duchy agreed to this, Führer would certainly not look for any quarrel, but he had nevertheless taken precautions. This is again the, uh, uh, I think, Ribbentrop speaking. The Führer would certainly not look for any quarrel, but he had nevertheless taken precautions for all eventuality. He had in no way come to any decision, but as a result of certain occurrences and want of clearness on the part of the Russians, he had become suspicious. Thus, for example, the Russians had strengthened their forces along their western frontier which, of course, caused Germany to reinforce her troops, too, but only after the Russians had started. It really must have been a remarkable position, the German government, if the deputy of the Führer and the foreign secretary, neither of them knew, on the 10th and 13th of May 1941, that, Russia was going, that uh, Germany was going to attack Russia a month later. Well, that is the evidence which I have to present to the tribunal on this matter. I regret that it should have taken so long and I'm deeply grateful to the tribunal for their patience.